Okay, the subcommittee will come to order. Good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Agricultural Appropriation Subcommittee's uh, first hearing for FY15. Um, I uh, would like to approach our uh, FY15 bills with uh, basically three things in mind. Uh, number one, ensuring the proper use of funds through robust, robust oversight. Uh, second, ensuring the appropriate level of regulation and protect producers and the public. And ensuring funding is targeted to vital programs. The audits and investigations conducted by the Office of the Inspector General are key uh, to the subcommittee's effort to ensure the proper use of funds to detect and reduce waste, fraud, and abuse, and to strengthen the management of USDA's agency and programs. Uh, the work is vital to us to make sure that the decisions on how to allocate the funds uh, and our oversight work to ensure that the funding that we provide is utilized in a proper way. This morning, I'm pleased to uh, welcome USDA Inspector General Phyllis Fong, Assistant Inspector General for Investigations Karen Ellis, and, in, and Assistant Inspector General for Audits Gil Harden uh, to the hearing this morning. So welcome and thank each of you for being here. Uh, Mrs. Fong, I'd like to first of all congratulate you on receiving the Distinguished uh, Federal Le Leadership Award uh, from the Association of Government Accountants uh, last month. Uh, for those of you who may not know, this uh, recognizes federal officials who exemplify and promote excellence in enhancing sound financial management legislation, regulations, practices, policies, and systems. So we're fortunate to have you at USDA, Ms. Fong, and thank you uh, for your service. Uh, before I begin uh, the hearing, I do want to recognize our ranking member, uh, Mr. Farr uh, from California, for any opening comments that he might like to make. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I apologize for being late. I um, appreciate you getting the, the hearing started. This is the first hearing of the year, and we start with the Inspector General. I have to tell you, I, I have mixed emotions about Inspector Generals. Um, I think that uh, where you can be very constructive in improving government uh, is great, but I've also seen a lot of unintended consequences from uh, IG reports that have led to <laughs> things getting a lot worse. Uh, before I got into pol elected politics, I worked in the auditors in the uh, legislative analyst office in Sacramento under a really famous uh, fellow who started the first state legislative analyst office, Alan Post. And uh, I found that oftentimes when we were analyzing the programs for the legislature, what we learned was that the program just, I mean, the legislature didn't write good law. And there and got a lot of un unintended consequences. And I, and what I'd, I'd like to I, I appreciate that you're also a member of the federal inspectors generals, uh, federal what do, what do you call it the government wide program where you uh, 73 ins federal in, uh, inspectors. I just I want to get to questioning. I want to just discuss some of the issues of how you fix things that are broken. But I appreciate one, I echo the appreciation for the award you received. We love public servants that are recognized by their peers as outstanding, and you're certainly one of them. And uh, thank you for being here today. Thank you. Uh, as this is our first meeting, let me just uh, go over a little a few things about how the procedure for the hearings are uh, to our members. Uh, and we will work under, as we always in the, have in the past, under the five-minute rule. Uh, Members uh, will be recognized for five minutes in the order of seniority at the dais at the beginning of the hearing and then in order of appearance. Uh, we'll alternate between the majority and the minority members. And um, we may have a, a, a couple of rounds to allow members to get their question in. So uh, I'd like to um, ask anybody with electronic devices uh, if you can turn them off or put them on silent. Uh, that would be helpful. Uh, Inspector uh, General Fong, uh, Note that your written testimony will be included in the record, and uh, I'd like to recognize you now for your uh, uh, oral statement, and then we'll proceed with questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Farr, and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the very warm welcome that you are extending to our office today. And as always, we appreciate the interest that you show in our work and what we do at USDA. As you know, our mission is to help USDA deliver its programs effectively and with integrity, and we provide audit and investigative services. Since you have my full written statement, let me just highlight some of the significant work we did over the last year, as well as some of the work that we have in process that may be of interest. In the area of food safety, we recently reported on swine slaughter plants 
and we found that a number of plants repeatedly violated food safety regulations with little or no consequence. We also issued a report on the need for FSIS to test boxed beef for E. coli. That report came out a number of months ago, but we believe is very significant. We are currently conducting audits of FSIS's public health information system for the domestic inspection module, and we are also doing an inspection of ground turkey processing. OIG focuses also on helping USDA safeguard and effectively deliver its programs. Given the importance of the SNAP program, it had an $86 billion budget last year, which represents 56 percent of USDA's portfolio. We in OIG devoted more than half of our investigative resources to addressing trafficking in SNAP benefits. And this resulted in almost 400 convictions and over $49 million in FY 2013. We also spent a number of uh, resources on our audit side to issue recommendations to the department to better screen SNAP retailers who wish to enter the program and remain in the program. This year, we have kicked off an initiative with FNS to work collaboratively to address SNAP fraud on a multi-agency level that will involve our state and local partners as well. We have great uh, expectations that this program will be proactive. Other work that we have in process focuses on how FNS reports its SNAP payment error rates, and we are also looking at factors that are causing high average food costs in the WIC program. Finally, as you all know, we work to help USDA improve its overall management systems. This year we issued reports on the department's settlement of the civil rights complaints um, as a, as a follow-on to the Pigford litigation. We also issued reports on IT security, financial statements, and improper payments. We have ongoing work on the claims review process for women and Hispanic farmers, and we also are looking at the use of Economy Act transfers and reimbursable agreements by the department as it manages its funds. Let me just um, briefly conclude my oral statement by addressing the FY15 request for the OIG. As you all know, in response to government-wide budget constraints, we have had to streamline our operations, as has every other federal agency, and we are presently operating at our lowest level of staffing. We want to thank you um, at the subcommittee for providing us with a much-needed increase in <coughs> FY14. This will enable us to provide more effective oversight of USDA programs while we continue to look for cost-saving opportunities within our operation. For FY15, the President's request provides a modest increase for us to adopt an innovative approach to addressing improper payments in USDA programs. And we hope that you are able to support that request. Uh, we are hoping to use data analytics to really focus on the level of improper payments across USDA, uh, starting with the issues that we see in RMA and some of the other agencies. So thank you today for inviting me to testify before the subcommittee, and we are pleased to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, uh, Inspector. Uh, I'll, first of all, I'd like to uh, start out with something that uh, I believe I had mentioned last year when we uh, started out the subcommittee, uh, and um, that was talking about the challenges and, and the successes. Uh, you've mentioned some of those in your uh, opening statement, uh, but um, I think last year I asked about the USDA's greatest challenges and whether the uh, department is doing enough to address those challenges. Uh, and uh, can you talk a little bit about what you see from your perspective and from your office, what is the greatest challenges as you look to the year ahead? Well, that's, that's a very good question and it gives us a chance to look at the body of our work and see the major themes coming out. Uh, as we were preparing for this hearing, we were talking and one of the things that we see across the department is that there is a need to provide more attention to effective management of the department's programs and oversight of programs, both within the agencies and with respect to third-party providers of benefits. Uh, we 
we've done a number of reports in the agencies. I think if you look at our IT security reports, that's an indication of some of the problems that we are seeing with agencies who need to really focus on their IT security. Um, improper payments becomes a symptom of perhaps the need for more effective oversight of how agencies deliver programs. And, and what we are seeing is that in this era of budget constraints, program managers are looking as a top priority to deliver programs, to get the money out, to get the benefits out to recipients and participants. And we believe that that is a very important goal. When an agency has perhaps less resources than it's had in the past, sometimes agencies have to make some tough choices about delivering benefits versus making sure that there are enough controls in place, that there's enough oversight of how those benefits are delivered. And we believe that there needs to be a little more attention on the oversight side um, of that. We see that in the SNAP program, in the nutrition programs, in the crop insurance programs, in the farm programs. Um, and as, as our statement points out, we are doing continued work on those oversight uh, efforts by the, by the agencies to see how effective those programs are working. What, um, where is uh, USDA, in what areas are they doing a good job in, in tackling the, the waste, fraud, and abuse? Well, we are very um, encouraged by the partnership that we have with FNS. Uh, we recognize that the SNAP program poses a number of challenges for everyone at the federal, state, and local levels in terms of delivery. But <coughs> FNS has been very uh, willing and enthusiastic in terms of working with us to roll out our initiative this year. And let me just talk a little bit about that. Uh, we are partnering with them to work with state and local uh, administrative agencies as well as law enforcement to really get at some of the root causes for vulnerabilities and fraud in the program and to ensure that fraud where we find it is being addressed both at the retailer as well as the local recipient level and to also proactively get the message out to people around the country that if they engage in fraudulent activities, that they, there will be some consequences to that. So we are rolling that initiative out as we speak, and FNS has been a very, very active partner. <coughs> you mentioned about the uh, oversight of programs and how important that is. Uh, is that your, <coughs> I, that, I assume that's what would be one of your top recommendations for USDA. Uh, what are some other recommendations that would be near the top there that would fall in that same category? We feel very strongly that the department needs to focus on its IT security initiatives. I think there is a recognition at the department that this is a significant issue. Um, the use of IT cuts across all program areas. Uh, as we are becoming more computerized, it's essential that we have good databases and security of data. I think there's a good recognition of the problem. The solutions are taking time and they will continue to require time and attention. Thank you. Mr. Farr. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I'd like to pursue a little bit of just the process in which the IGs work because you're on the council of your chair, aren't you, of the, of the uh, Council on Integrity and Efficiency. Congratulations. That's you're in charge of, what, 73 other inspector generals? Um, let's take the SNAP question that, that uh, the chairman asked. I mean, that, that seems to me, of, and I'm just quickly thinking, that it, there's probably n no program in the federal government that do has more responsibilities to audit uh, the recipient of the money, of the benefit, and then how that benefit is spent. In most cases, it's just, does the money get to the right place? not how is the money from the person spent. Nobody checks how Social Security money is spent, um, but they do check on how SNAP programs are spent. So 
as you review these, and obviously, as you said, it's a huge program. It's what eight, how, fifty-six percent of the entire uh, Department of Agriculture's budget uh, spent on food in America. Um, do you, do do you also come in with recommendations on how to improve the program, or just that it isn't? Because I've found in a lot of these programs, like the school school feeding program that I'm really interested in, we had seven or eight different programs within schools. Nobody's come in and said, why don't we put those under one title, manage them under one silo rather than seven separate silos, and, and whatever technology, because you're also reviewing use of technology, appropriate technology, sort of barcoding the, f the meals or barcoding the, the process. I mean, there's just... Do those recommendations, do, you, does, do the IGs come in and say there's a better way of managing this law that we're uh, required to have you comply with? Um, you've raised a number of very interesting thoughts in your question. Let me just comment on a number of them. Uh, you mentioned the Council of Inspectors General on Integrity and Efficiency. It is composed of the 73 federal IGs. And our task, our mission, is to identify issues that cut across multiple agencies and then to do cross-cutting work and come up with recommendations where appropriate. And as you mentioned... Uh, is that, excuse me, but is that also program change or just sort of how the IGs can better function? It's both. We, we do focus on how IGs can better function. We also look at program change. For example, we have issued reports in the last few years on suspension and debarment government-wide, uh -huh. on IT cybersecurity and how to better evaluate that. Um, we've done something on export and import trade. And one of the projects we're working on now deals with cloud security, the security of the agencies using cloud computing to manage a lot of their IT practices. As you can imagine, um, it's not always easy to find topics that cut across department and agency lines. Uh, for example, you know, you mentioned that on the Social Security side, um, that perhaps people do not look at how Social Security recipients spend their money. I well, there's no law. There's no law into that of how you spend it. Where there is with SNAP, you're limited to how you can spend the money. And along those or lines, the at the IG level, at the IG council level, government wide, what we would focus on in dealing with the IGs from say the Dep Social Security or say the Department of um, Health and Human Services with respect to Medicaid or Veterans Affairs with respect to Veterans Benefits is to find issues where that we have in common. For example, the need to match um, databases, mm -hmm. not to pay people who are on the death uh, master list or who may be ineligible for other reasons. And we have been able to do work at that kind of macro level. Does that come back to, f I mean, here all of us are elected to fix things that are broken in government. And some of us think sometimes that it's broken on the collection side, and some of us think it's broken on the, on the expenditure side. Uh, I mean, that's the politics. But it seems to me that you're, the, the thing I see in Congress, different from when I was in local and state government, is that we do everything on a on a very general level. We make law very general. And then we have these rule writing uh, that gets into the writing the detail. But the, the only people that really examine and know how it, how it really ends up on the street are people like inspector generals and or managers of those programs. And very rarely do we get back sort of the feedback. You designed this thing poorly. It just, you're not going to work the way you've written it. There's a smarter, better way. That's what the kind of feedback, and you know what, nobody knows that except the technicians on the inside. I always tell everybody who's a f in a f public employee, tell us what's broken. If you're running a program and you have to do a bunch of dumb, dumb stuff, we want to know dumb, dumb, because we can fix dumb, dumb, but we don't get it. I mean, we don't always get it unless there's sort of a scandal or something like that, and, and I just wondered if part of your responsibilities was to come back and say, you know what, uh, either the law or the regs are just poorly written. And that is a very good point. We do try to point that out in our reports where we think that a regulation or a law c should be looked at and perhaps revised. Um, the one that comes to mind immediately is our recent report on SNAP retailers and how the department authorizes and reauthorizes retailers who participate. Um, there are a number of recommendations we made in there that may require a change to law or regulation if the department decides it wants to pursue that. And so I would draw your staff's attention to some of those recommendations. Mm -hmm. 
Mr. Latham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome. Uh, appreciate your work. Uh, uh, in your testimony you reported a lack of adequate enforcement procedures and security measures uh, meant to protect the National Agricultural Statistics Service information and uh, understanding how important security is on that information, the effects it can have on markets and uh, insider trading, whatever that. Uh, uh, it's a little concerning to me to hear that there are real problems. Uh, was there any data that was actually released prior to uh, when it should have been, or do you know if, if information did get out ahead of uh, uh, to affect the market? Yes, sir. We'd probably have to get back with you on, on details, but before we did our review, I think a couple of years prior, there was some information that was released a couple of minutes ahead of time. Uh, are you on that. I, I don't know the exact impact that it had on the market. Okay. Are you confident now that the information is secure, that the data is not? I, I know that as we did the review and we brought the problems to NAS, they were very receptive and started working on fixing the problems before the field work was even finished. So uh, in terms of their recognition of the problem, I think they have a better handle on it now. We'd have to go back and look at it in the future to see if the fixes. Do you have any additional recommendations or anything to them, to any other concerns or other than what you've already? Okay. Uh, there were, uh, like in your testimony, uh, get 17 audits and uh, as a result determined there was $424 million of, uh, quote, questioned or unsupported costs at USDA and uh, uh, there was $12 million that was recommended for recovery and 412 not. Uh, well, why would you not want to recover more than Twelve million, rather than the four hundred and twelve. Let me just talk generally in terms of our recommendations. Uh, we, as you point out, we make dollar recommendations in a number of categories, and uh, that cost avoidance category generally applies when we're making recommendations to the agency to take action before the money goes out. Don't let the money go out to an ineligible person. The recovery category is when the money has already gone out, and we tell the agency, take a look at this. We think it may have gone, and they may be using it for an ineligible purpose or an improper purpose. We will make those recommendations. Uh, at that point, the agency then has to assess uh, whether they can take action, whether it's within the statute of limitations, uh, whether they have a likelihood of recovery, um, whether there's any other factor that comes into play there. And so we work with the agency to come up with recommendations that are possible and implementable. Gil, did you yeah. want to add? And, and just to point out, a big part of the number that was not recommended for recovery, I think if I go back and look at the details, they're going to be connected with statistical projections. So on the, we take a sample, and if we do it statistically, if there are individual members of that sample where we note that they were potentially ineligible, ineligible. We can make specific recommendations to the agency to go look at those specific sample items. But then with our statistician, we can take that data and apply it to the universe that we were looking at at that point in time, which comes up with an amount that's potentially ineligible, but it's something that's not recoverable because it's not connected with a specific. So these numbers are actually projections of maybe? Statistically, yes, those. Okay. Uh, I, again, define your, your question, unsupported costs. What, what does that mean? The unsupported cost category is where they did not have the documentary support for whatever okay. the decision was. And they couldn't provide it to us during field work. Now, maybe they were able to provide it to us after uh, they were able to come up with it, or, or if not, then it stays as unsupported. It's part of that question cost category. For example, if, if the department were to give a grant to a recipient to carry out a certain kind of activity, and the recipient then claimed costs under the grant, say for salaries or for purchase of equipment or whatever it is, um, 
if they don't have the supporting receipts or documentation, then the department should not be paying that. It, it, the, the claimed costs need to be supported and justified. I'm out of time. Thank you. Ms. Pingree. Ms. Pingree. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your testimony and all of the work you do on behalf of the USDA and in investigating things that really need to be understood. Um, let me just uh, start with the, the some of the questions around how you decide um, where to focus your investigations. You did a great job in the beginning, I think, explaining that because SNAP is such a large percentage of the budget at USDA, it's been a focus, and you've certainly done a lot of work on trying to sort out what the areas are of fraud. Um, it's always a volatile topic here when it comes to the policy and the funding. And um, I appreciate the fact that you've really started to look at um, some of the retailing issues as opposed to just focusing on individuals, because I think all too often we think about the individual who committed the fraud. Uh, so I want to just get a little bit of a comparison. I see from uh, 2012 data about 50 percent of your investigations went into SNAP fraud. Um, my understanding is about 99 percent of the people eligible for SNAP are completely truly eligible. So clearly some of this is happening in the retailing side. Payment accuracy is 96.2 percent from 2011 data. Um, in Maine, where I represent, the average SNAP benefit is about $122 a month. So individuals who do something incorrect aren't necessarily defrauding the government for high numbers. I, of course, want to compare this a little bit um, to some of the farmers who receive different kinds of payments through USDA. And the average of the top 10 percent of farmers is $32,000 a year in crop subsidies. So just give me a sense on how, how much you've done on that side, given the dollar value, how able we are to understand when people are receiving those subsidies appropriately and how you balance out the use of those resources. And I would say, particularly in light of the fact that with this passage of the Farm Bill, there's going to be a tremendous number of changes in how farmers receive subsidies. So it seems to me it will be an area of a certain amount of confusion in the beginning. Let me just comment generally about how we set our priorities for our work. Um, as you mentioned, on, on our investigative side, which makes up about 40 percent of the resources of our office, SNAP has taken up more than half of our attention. And we generally focus on the retailers because that is the, the federal level of responsibility, leaving the recipient fraud generally to the state and locals to investigate. Now, both our audit side of the House and our investigative side of the House, uh, every year we look at the areas of highest risk within USDA as we plan our work. And in order to kind of assess that, we um, ask for input from Congress, from the Secretary, as to areas where, where you all might believe we could focus our attention. We also look at the history of the various programs in the portfolios based on our experience, the level of funding, um, whether there's new legislative initiatives that are being implemented, and any other factor that could come into play, we then um, decide what areas pose the greatest risk at the current time and are ripe for a look. Um, many times we will not look at a very new program because we want to give the agency a chance to start implementing it. Uh, I think if you look at our full portfolio, you will see that every year we are mandated by law to carry out financial statement audits, which we do of the, f of the whole department. We have to look at IT security. Um, we have to look at improper payments by law. And so we spend quite a bit of resources on that. We've also spent a lot of time on the conservation programs because uh, of the way those programs have been managed in the past. Crop insurance is a matter of great interest to us, as is any food safety issue. Uh, that, that tends to be one of our top priorities. So <clears throat> perhaps I um, could have the opportunity to do a little more uh, research on this, or you could provide me with that. But I am curious, um, given the, some of the priorities are around improper payments and in um, what will be quite a bit of changes in crop insurance. So again, I'm, I'm somewhat interested in how many improper payments or how that's evaluated when it comes to subsidies to farmers. And you may not have all that information today, but I would be 
just generally interested in understanding better how well we're able to investigate that and how much of your resources go to that investigation. And just as a little follow-up on that, um, so I know that part of the new uh, resources that are in the President's budget are on the creation of these audit centers of excellence, which seems like a, a potentially good way of going about doing that. So again, in the future, do you have an um, understanding of how much of that will be devoted to um, investigating SNAP fraud as opposed to investigating um, subsidy payments? Um, we'd be happy to provide some additional detail for the record. Um, on Great. I'm out of time, so you, I, I know you probably don't have a lengthy answer, but we'd be happy to get more information on that. We'll be happy to provide that. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Mr. Nunley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Paul, last, or you stated in your report that uh, the USDA is not complied with the Improper Payments Elimination Recovery Act of 2010. Uh, what areas is the USDA uh, lacking full compliance with IPERA? Well, um, there are seven areas that we're supposed to assess, and they're non-compliant with three of them. Uh, they I have not. Uh, Gil, go ahead. <laughs> Make sure the, you get the, it right. The three areas that they were not compliant that they were not complying with is that for two programs, we, we found issues with eight of the sixteen high-risk programs. I mean, I, of eight of the 16 what? High-risk programs that are, that are covered as part of IPERA. So for two programs, they have not published improper payment estimates. For two programs, they haven't pu published improper payment rates of less than 10 percent. And then in six programs, they haven't met their annual reduction targets. So what are they doing to, to correct the, these areas? Well, I know that this was the second year in a row that we had, we had reported the noncompliance, and so we're, we're doing the current work right now, but they, they had to get with OMB and, and do some extra stuff this year because they have not shown compliance. But I'll have to get back to you on exactly what they've done. All right. So we'll, yeah, we'll submit that for the record. All right. Last year you testified that uh, there, there were 10 states uh, that uh, had not met, met deadlines for recommendations that, that you had recommended for the state compliance. Where are we with those? Those are with the, the SNAP yes. databases. Yeah. Those are with the SNAP yes. databases, and we have gotten agreement with FNS on all of those recommendations in terms of th the plan forward in terms of making corrections. Uh, we had initiated or, or had planned to start work to do some follow-up work in that area, but when we started that work earlier this year, we learned that FNS had let its own contract out to look at some of the very same things that we were going to look at, where they're working with states to improve uh, the methods for tracking down, you know, the improper payments. So what we're doing with that right now is monitoring how they're doing to see whether we need to go in in the future, as opposed to duplicating the effort that they're doing right now. So is it reasonable to think that when we come back this time next year, we'll be able to report that they've made significant progress? I'll look into that and see if we, if we can say that. I know that we can, one of the things that we're working on right now is their quality control rate, and we're continuing, we're starting to see problems with that error rate as well, as well as errors with the school lunch and breakfast. So it's a big, big problem, and they are making incremental changes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Portman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Ms. Fong, first let me thank you, congratulate you on the major award you received. Uh, and several years ago when I was chairman of the subcommittee on nutrition on the House Agricultural Committee, uh, we had a robust dialogue about um, fraud or waste in the SNAP program. You took some additional initiative there and, and, and dug a little deeper, and I think we've got some good outcomes. So thank you for that initiative. Um, I think it's important to say for up front that this is America. We don't let people bleed in the street. We don't let people starve in their homes. And that's why programs such as SNAP are important. Given the magnitude of it, uh, given the amount of money that it spends, even a small bit of fraud in it creates the potential for savings, which in turn are necessary in this tight fiscal time. But also, it's not fair to those who are in vulnerable circumstances to have the dollars that could be used to help them diverted to people who are abusing the system. So this, in that spirit, is that's why we tend to focus pretty narrowly, pretty quickly on the, on the SNAP program. Back to that point, 
Um, where do you find, are you, do you find fraud in the program concentrated in one area of the country or, or another? I don't think we would say it's concentrated in particular areas uh, because we don't, you know, it's, it's hard to project that. We do have major investigations going on all the time um, around the country in all of the major urban centers that you can imagine. The initiative that we're working on with FNS um, has identified a couple of areas th that we are going to focus on um, because the state and local authorities there are happy to work with us and because we see opportunity there. And That's I on the retailer side? The retailer as well as recipient. It, it will um, address well, all of those Can I ask you a question? Uh, just <coughs> simply, how does the most basic type of fraud take place? In other words, if you're a, you're a SNAP recipient, somebody offers you some cash for the use of the card, is that the, the, the fundamental way in which SNAP recipients can, could potentially abuse a program? And the same thing for the retailer? That, that's basically the scheme. There are many variations on it, but the, the idea is that if you're a recipient, you offer your card up, you get perhaps 50 cents on the dollar for that. Yeah. Um, so you're free to spend that money any way you see fit. And then wh the, re the re retailer can redeem that card and get full value for it. And I recognize that this fraud in the program has dropped significantly since going to the electronic benefit, but this basic problem still potentially exists and, and, and is dependent upon the, the, the goodwill, the self-enforcement of the person using it primarily. I manage that. It's very difficult to stop. Um, you, we walked through this a little bit, but I wanted to get a better understanding of how you prioritize your work, how you prioritize your audits. Is it simply based upon the magnitude of the programs, where the money is spent, so you tend to divide up what you have uh, in terms of resources and focus in those areas, or when something uh, arises that looks problematic and you're alerted to, do you tend to prioritize that? It's all of those factors. Okay. And um, who makes that decision? We do, the senior staff within IG. I assume you'd want suggestions. Absolutely. We okay. welcome suggestions from all members of Congress. Well, two, two points. You've asked for a budgetary increase. I think it would be helpful to, to do some type of study to, to show that if you're the correlation between budgetary increases and better outcomes for programs measured in terms of impact as well as cost savings. That way it, it, it helps very much justify the case for an increase in your part. The second issue before I'm out of time is uh, Ms. Pingree had a, a very good point. We're interested in stopping fraud, making the system more effective, no matter where it is. And in this regard, uh, I'm interested in the question of exotic legal arrangements that help skirt payment limitations and uh, actively engaged rules, if you will, for the appropriation of farm payments. Th this is an area that I think we need to take a closer look at. I appreciate that. We um, do have information on our return on investment. Over the last eight years, we've averaged $12 for every dollar invested in our operation. And so we strongly believe that any increase in budget for us will result in better and more audits and investigations that bring back more money to the government. And in terms of payment limitations and actively engaged issues, we are very aware of those. Uh, we have a long history of carrying out investigations into schemes involving that, as well as some audit work in that area. So we, we will take your suggestion and explore that for next year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Roney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, last month, your office released an audit of the USDA's National Agricultural Statistical Service, or NAS. Uh, your security review found that the agency failed to adequately enforce critical security procedures and physical security measures intended to protect NASA's information. You also identified several instances, instances where s sensitive commodity market data was compromised due to lapses in technology. Um, has your office decided to con conduct 
additional audits related to the security of NAS and the programs? Not at this, not at this time because they have been very receptive and proactive in working on the recommendations and the problems that we noted. And so we would probably include it as in future planning to go back and, and see if, if the measures they took, you know, solve the problems. What would you be looking for to see if they do solve those problems? I mean, we would follow up on the recommendations that we, we've just made. We'd give them time to implement those recommendations and then see if they implemented them. Okay. Um, NAS collects personally identifiable information data from, uh, for a number of surveys, including the agricultural census. So based on the findings in your recent security review, do you believe we should be concerned about the USDA's ability to sufficiently protect this sensitive data as well? That was not something that was specifically part of it. If I can get back to you on that, I would Okay. Thank you. And do you believe that NASA's security weaknesses could lead to potential violation of the agency's statu statutorily required confidentiality pledge? I would also like to get back to you on that. USDA also has a good uh, deal of secret and sensitive non-personally identifiable information, including sensitive information regarding its plant and animal disease um, research. What's your assessment of the USDA cybersecurity on this type of data? That I don't think we've done recent work, but I'll, I can look and see what we've done in the past. Okay. I, I ask a lot of this because I also sit on the Intelligence Committee, so this is sort of an area that I'm, I'm interested in, so I appreciate your uh, getting back to me on. Um, the next question is, does the agency have sufficient resources dedicated to protecting its secret, non-personally identifiable information. That, let me get back to you on that one, too. Finally, Mr. Chairman, does the agency have appropriate safeguards in place to ensure only those allowed to access the information are able to do so? I'm, um, I'm, I'm just going inter to interject here. And since you have a background in intelligence and data, you know that um, every year we have to do a review under the FISMA uh, statute, which does a comprehensive look at the department's IT security across agencies and th from the whole IT security process from soup to nuts. And I think it's safe to say that over the last few years we have found significant issues with the department's overall IT security uh, processes. We've made 49 recommendations to correct them to come into compliance with NIST guidelines. And many of the questions that you're asking really go to the kinds of points that we've been making that the department needs to tighten up and, and come into compliance on the, in those areas. So I, I just wanted to offer that as background. Well, if, if you could also help me with, with the answers to those questions as well, maybe uh, I can help you in, in that regard. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Valdeo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you mentioned FNS's work with state agencies on fraud. I know California has, has uh, in specific, has had problems with their WIC oversight. Uh, the WIC moratorium in California was a product of abuse of the system. And I'm very pleased with action, or action was taken. With that being said, the uh, moratorium was set in 2008, and uh, little has changed since then. What steps have been taken in California uh, to address the control of high-risk vendors? I, I do know, and it's, it's, it's information that we'll have to get to you later, but as part, of our, as part of our current review of the WIC program where we're looking at how states are containing costs or how costs for the food packages are, are determined, California is part of our review and it, it touches on some of those questions. Well, the, one of the issues that we face, obviously, with my part of the country uh, in California, we're suffering from this water crisis, and unemployment numbers are getting to uh, pretty extreme numbers now. Um, WIC is obviously something that's important to a lot of those people in, in, the, in the area. But at the same time, you've got new uh, stores opened up with an opportunity for those people to be uh, serviced or, or be able to purchase their product through uh, stores closer to home, uh, something more convenient for these people, and that opportunity is not being afforded them, and I think it's something that needs to be looked into. So I appreciate uh, looking into it and seeing what we can come up with. Thank you. 
Mr. Bishop. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question on foreign ag service. Uh, as you know, during June of 2010, uh, the U.S. Agency for International Development uh, transferred $86.3 million to the Department of Agriculture for capacity building activities in Afghanistan. And the OIG just recently released an audit of the Foreign Agriculture Services management of those funds and the program's activities in Afghanistan. And the audit found that FES had been aware of deficiencies in the management of the capacity building activities over in Afghanistan for quite a while, but did not adequately uh, implement corrective actions uh, to strengthen the management and control of the activities until two years after uh, the audit, and after the funds were dispersed, I should say. Uh, the audit recommended that uh, FES forego accepting any further uh, USAID funds until full implementation and a formal monitoring process and other controls were put in place. Um, has FES begun to implement the recommendations uh, as well as those of their consultants? Uh, how much, can you tell us how much has been spent in the capacity building activities before your audit and did you see any positive results from the money spent? And finally, uh, does FES have similar capacity building uh, programs in other parts of the world? And if so, uh, should we be concerned with uh, the management of those uh, programs as well? Yeah. Um, in terms of whether the, the, and I may not get all the questions, so if I forget one, <laughs> I, I may ask to, to have it repeated. But in terms of implementing the recommendations from the consultant, as, in, in response to our recommendation to, to get those started, we do know that those are underway. Uh, from my understanding, you know, I would have to rely on the numbers that are in the report in terms of how much money they've spent in terms of what we looked at. I do know that this was the largest amount of money in these types of funds that they had ever tried to manage. And so they recognized that as we had discussions with that, that they really were not equipped to handle it right off the bat. And, they're in, and as far as capacity building of this nature in other parts of the world, I'm not aware of any, but I'll go back and, and ask. And Well, let me just generally comment that we are still in the process of going through the Farm Bill, trying to get a handle on what the new provisions are and what they might mean to us as we develop our priorities for next year's work. Um, it, I appreciate the fact that both you and Mr. Fortenberry have raised the issue of actively engaged. I think that's a very difficult and complex issue. Um, I know in, in our history at USDA IG, we've had a number of cases where we've taken successful prosecutions against people who have taken advantage of some of the um, different approaches to that, people who've, you know, engaged with, sev created 17 or 18 straw partnerships to treble or quadruple or whatever the amount of money that they get under that program fraudulently. So we are aware that there are some uh, vulnerabilities in that, and I appreciate your, your raising that. How, how does the fraud 
waste and abuse uh, with regard to the insurance programs, uh, the uh, FSA programs uh, stack up with the fraud and nutrition in terms of dollars uh, with the uh, nutrition programs, such as SNAP, WIC, and, and the other nutrition programs. I think that based on the work that we've done the past several years and with the uh, large influx of funds in the SNAP program, I mean, we are seeing a large amount of fraud there just because it is large dollars. Um, with regard to farm programs, I do know that we have cases across the country, both in um, the various farm program uh, cases as well as crop insurance. Um, so far, our work is not stacking up to the same amount as we are on SNAP. Um, in terms of uh, the percentage of, uh, of fraud uh, and the dollars in, in fraud, uh, do the nutrition programs uh, add up to more fraud uh, or less fraud uh, as compared to the uh, um, disaster programs and the uh, FSA programs? It's hard for us to actually figure out what the fraud amount is. What I can go based on is the type of work that we do and where we are spending our time. And um, with regard to SNAP, you don't I have any idea about the number of dollars? No, because um, we don't know all of the fraud that is actually going on. There could be parts of fraud that I'm just not aware of. I mean, the ones that you have investigated right. and that you have found. We have, uh, the larger amount has been in the SNAP program as opposed to the other farm programs. Uh, and just to follow up on that, was it on the part of the, those administering the program? Uh, was it a part of, uh, on the part of those who uh, were recipients? Uh, where, where did the fraud, was it the vendors? With regard to SNAP, our responsibility is chiefly with the retailers, so our work is mainly with the retailers, and that's where we are seeing the fraud. The states and the locals are responsible for dealing with the majority of the recipient fraud. I'll offer a couple of comments on the dollars. Just looking at our investigative statistics for the last two years or so, in the farm programs, we had about $33 million in terms of investigative recoveries for fraud. And in the crop insurance program, about $40 million. Um, there is a huge case in North Carolina involving the tobacco farmers that accounts for that. So I think what we are seeing is that when we find fraud in those programs, they tend to be involving multi-million dollars um, and, and many people. In the FSA, in FSA and RMA. We're going to need to move on. Mr. Yoder. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Inspector Fong, thank you for your testimony this morning. I appreciate having you before the committee. Uh, certainly a lot of issues have been covered. Uh, there are uh, probably many, many more we won't have time for this morning as the USDA is a vast um, uh, agency with a lot of responsibilities. Uh, I think a lot of our conversations this morning have been how we try to um, provide the services the USDA is supposed to provide uh, for the most amount of people and the most effective uh, and cost uh, efficient way, which is I think what everybody, both parties and everyone in this town I think hopes occurs. Uh, I, I'd like to discuss maybe one that hasn't been brought up this morning and this was um, uh, the WIC program. Uh, and I don't know if you're familiar with the Government Accountability Office uh, report last year about the WIC program in February of 2013, uh, which was entitled Improved Oversight of Income Eligibility Determination Needed. And it highlighted some disturbing trends that have occurred uh, in the WIC program related to how states are implementing it in an inconsistent manner. Uh, and it talks about, uh, in part, uh, how over 60% of states use only income within the last 30 days when the standard for WIC eligibility is annual household income. Um, uh, they only count uh, a portion of the income of a household instead of the household uh, income of every member of a household. Um, uh, some states have increased their eligibility thresholds beyond the 185 percent of the federal poverty level and their uh, adjunctum eligibility uh, options that as states increase the threshold uh, for other programs then they become uh, adjunctively eligible for the WIC program. Um, the GEO study found that um, 
The uh, FNS has never examined the, the reports uh, for state and local WIC agencies' compliance with federal regulations, despite over one-third of the states having problems in this area, and that the last time the FNS provided guidance to states on income eligibility determinations was 1999. This has led to a point where now over half of the infants in the country born in this country start out on a federal program. They start out on, on the WIC program. And so um, we want to ensure that dollars we spend go to the, the, the uh, families that are most needy and that uh, uh, the idea that the majority of the country would be uh, uh, on these programs from birth uh, because of ineffective implementation from states is very concerning to, I think, all of us uh, on the committee. And I guess, are you familiar with this report and what sort of um, inspection have you looked into as to how the FNS could um, resolve these concerns that were, I think, disturbingly brought up in the GAO report? I guess just as a way to start, being as GAO was already looking at that, we did not do work on income eligibility just so that we weren't duplicating efforts. Mm -hmm. Yes, we were aware of what they were doing. Some of the work that we reported on last year that would be a little different, but it also part of the problem is how the states oversee the vendors and their vendor management because there had been a new rule on that. And we, we noted some similar type problems where they weren't doing the monitoring that they should have been doing. And currently we have work in process to, to look at how states um, the cost of the, of the food baskets for the different participants to see how some states make those dollars go further than others and if, if there's ways that we could have more consistency, consistencies in that from state to state. So are you aware of um, FNS efforts to correct uh, these um, uh, problems that were cited in the GAO report? I would have to go back and look and see what, the, what they said they were going to do. And, I don't have specific work right now to see if they are doing those, if that's what you're asking. Right. So as far as you know, that these, these uh, s this state implementation uh, that is inconsistent in allowing these things to occur, it's continuing to this very day? We, we are seeing some of that in our work, that there's inconsistencies from state to state. Well, I'd ask you to look into that. Um, you know, there are many, many areas where this occurs, where we have s uh, states that don't follow the guidelines. And um, it's not fair, I think, to folks in states that do follow the guidelines. And as the policies are implemented in an inconsistent way, um, uh, it doesn't get to the people that need it the most uh, as these programs get stretched uh, and um, ex expanded beyond our capacity to, uh, to support them. Uh, just maybe one general question on USDA and their size and operation. I mean, one of our um, hopes on this committee is that, w is that we can um, you know, run our, a, a leaner operation in Washington, D.C., therefore allowing the dollars that we do spend here that are scarce to be able to spend them to actually help folks who, who need them the most. Uh, what measures have you suggested or have you seen the USDA can use to um, provide uh, greater uh, services to, to farmers and, um, and, and folks that they are charged with overseeing and regulating and providing services to uh, in a more cost-effective manner uh, using technology or um, uh, in a way that uh, m might create savings over the long term? How can we uh, run the USDA in a, in a um, more cost-effective manner? have to go back and, and pull some sp specific recommendations, but we've noted <coughs> across the department and in, in terms of talking to the program officials, agency heads, in terms of now that you're in a leaner operating environment, to, to really look at their operations from a risk-based approach to make sure that they're prioritizing their work and monitoring where, the, where they really need to be spending that. The, the analogy I, I use with them is that in the past, if you had a priority to look at 10 things and you can't look at all 10 things anymore, you can only look at five. Tell me what those five are and how you got to those decisions so I can, so we can either agree or disagree as to how you, you got there. And there are a variety of, 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 there's a variety of work that we've done and I just have to go back and pull up specifics where we've talked to them about their use of computers and in and, and, and rural development as well as some of the farm programs to better use that information and have the information to, to do it on a leaner staff. And the reason I really go to this point, I think this was brought up on, 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 on by one of my colleagues as well, is that you have, you know, we have less farmers today than we had years ago and is the USDA or their operations consistently consistent with the dollars per farmer ratio is that uh, how are we responding to the changing agriculture world I think one of the things that we have been seeing in our reviews across the board is a as you mentioned um, it's important that the states implement effectively and consistently all the programs that they have. It's also important that USDA program managers and agency officials communicate 
effectively with their state and regional structures, the federal structures. Um, as, as the programs decentralize and more staff is put into the field and the responsibilities devolve into the field, it's critical that the field employees really understand the programs, the requirements of the programs as they administer them with its respect to individual farmers, conservationists, and ranchers. And we are seeing that um, with the departure of institutional knowledge um, and less staff and perhaps less training, uh, there needs to be increased focus on that from at, on the part of the USDA officials at the management level. Right. Thank you for your response. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in fact, uh, General, let me, when I started out the question, we talked about the challenges and, and department didn't do enough to address some of the issues that um, and successes that uh, we see. Let me pose one question to you and just summing that up. If, um, if you were the secretary, um, what would you focus your efforts on uh, in that regard as far as uh, trying to make sure that uh, uh, that the issues that are before that you see that need to be dealt with from your chair as inspector general uh, and you were advising the secretary or if you were to change positions to be the secretary what would be uh, the effort that you would focus your effort on I think it all goes back to the very basic issue of leading and managing a department with a diverse portfolio, you have to set a very strong tone, which I believe the secretary does, that management is important. It's important in delivering our programs that we deliver them effectively to the right people and that we avoid situations where fraud or improper payments could occur. And that, that message needs to then permeate the organization. It is a huge organization. Um, I think each agency has its challenges in terms of workforce and resources and training and priorities. Uh, but I do believe that this secretary and deputy secretary have set that tone and are willing to be very supportive of the message that we bring forward as the Inspector General's office. When we find situations that require attention, uh, we find that the department does respond very positively to that. Oh, US, USDA is making improvements, uh, but still problems with uh, accurate reporting of improper payments, uh, uh, as we've discussed. In your testimony, you note that USDA has uh, had taken more effective measures, or if they had taken more effective measures uh, to avoid uh, noncompliance, it could have avoided a $74 million in improper payments. Um, what could USDA have done to save that $74 million? I think that goes back to our audit report um, that we were discussing a few minutes earlier about the major uh, whether USDA was in compliance with, with the Improper Payments Act. And our, the $74 million is our estimate of what USDA could have avoided if it had taken steps to comply with every portion of that act. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, and more specifically, it's if they had met the targets for, re for reducing improper payments that they set for themselves <laughs> for, for the six programs that that was associated with, they would, they would have <coughs> avoided $74 million in, in improper payments. So it's them meeting their targets. Okay. You all probably uh, are aware that the provisions in the Improper Payments Act now require uh, USDA to work with OMB to actively address these situations this year because it's been two years in a row that the department has not met those targets. Uh, what happens next year if, if the department continues to miss its targets is the department is then required to work with Congress to determine ways to address these issues. So there, there is an escalating uh, set of requirements in the Act. Oh, your report on SNAP, uh, retailers raised concerns about the Food and Nutrition Service's ability to effectively carry out oversight and enforcement activities related to fraud. And we've talked quite a bit this morning about uh, SNAP issues. but. Uh, the subcommittee has uh, repeatedly directed USDA to permanently disbar retailers that are found guilty of fraud. 
um, yet the report found that some retailers were still participating in the SNAP uh, program after being permanently disqualified. Uh, what more does the Food and Nutrition Services need to do to ensure that fraudulent retailers are permanently removed from SNAP? That's where we made recommendations where um, we, we felt that uh, legislative changes were needed and we're currently working with FNS to get agreement on those. Th their most current statements to us is that there were changes in the Farm Bill that may address some of the issues that we had. We're waiting for them to show us those things to see if, if those, whatever the provisions were, would address the problem. If not, we would continue to, to work with the department to make that a, a proposal because that's something that we feel that, that should be done. Thank you. Mr. Farr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Shooter, I want to invite you out to my uh, district. I, it's a different perspective on agriculture than I think um, your state. I, I, I represent one county, Monterey County, that the gross sales of, there's over 100 crops grown in the county, and the gross sales exceed that of 25 states in the United States of their total agricultural sales. So it's a, and it doesn't have any subsidies at all, no water subsidies, no power subsidies, no conservation subsidies, no price support. Uh, we don't grow the commodity programs, but we do rely on, you know, people eating nutritious food because that's what we grow, this, the salad mix of the world. But I, you know, and I, so I, I'm, I'm, and I, and we have a lot of poor people harvesting those crops, and they do rely on the WIC program and the SNAP program, and I think it's right that we look at particularly the retailers that are frauding. I, the individuals, I think the, sm the amount of money to try to collect from a poor person because of they bought the wrong thing is a little, we ought to put the emphasis on, as you've stated, on the retailers. But I want to shift because I think one of the biggest frauds that's happened uh, to the United States has been our expenditures on the war efforts in Iraq and Afghanistan. All we hear every day is the amount of, you know, contracts that have been uh, let that, that don't, and you, and you talk in your paper about, and I think Mr. Bishop brought it up, about uh, capacity building. You know, as a return Peace Corps volunteer, I'm very interested in countries' capacity building, and uh, we just got back from Colombia, which has been, we did a very successful thing with capacity building there. The m unfortunate thing is that every single, almost every single contract let was to an American company. So we really weren't building capacity within Colombia or Afghanistan or Iraq. We were building capacity of American contractors. And your report points out that uh, the uh, Department of International Development transferred $86.3 million uh, to USDA to uh, work on capacity building, I guess, agricultural ca capacity building in Afghanistan. And that uh, your review found that senior managers of FAS were aware of the general control weakness uh, before receiving the funding. Nevertheless, the FAS had not implemented performance monitoring plans for all the projects until over two years after the first project began. And you go on to say, without adequate management controls in place, FAS cannot effectively monitor these projects and faces difficulty in providing adequate insurance that the funds are effectively accomplishing the program goals, the program goals being capacity building. FSA has agreed to all the recommendations. So what happened? Did anything happen? It just agreed to the, your fact that you indicated that these things weren't in place and that there was money misspent and... I mean, we don't, I don't think Congress is asking enough questions about how our money is being spent in, in and I'm, I think capacity building is very important, but we ended up trying to dictate what capacities they ought to build, spend our money on it, and they don't use it, like that big, huge warehouse that we build in Afghanistan, uh, millions of dollars that the Afghans didn't want. Uh, we found out in Iraq we built all kinds of uh, generators for people, but never taught them how to r run the generators or change the oil and all that stuff melted down. I mean, there's, there's tons and tons, millions and <coughs> probably billions of dollars misspent. Is, in your Council on, of the Inspector Generals on Integrity and Efficiency, have you collectively looked at our uh, capacity building, so-called capacity building expenditures in, in, in our war effort? Because you're looking agency by agency, and I matter what the sum total of that 
Yeah, you uh, actually USDA has a very small piece of capacity building in effect in Afghanistan. Uh, most of the money that's going there, my understanding is it's coming through state defense and aid, and the inspectors general at those agencies are working together very closely. Um, they're on the ground in Afghanistan. Uh, the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction has issued a number of very hard-hitting reports showing that the funds have not been going to where they should be going. Uh, my understanding is that USDA, this is the one piece of the funding pot that we have. We don't have any more because FAS recognizes that it needs to put into place management, a management system of controls before it accepts any more funds. So I think, um, you know, from a macro level, the IEGs are in there. F at USDA, it's a very small piece of our portfolio. In this case, they knew before they even received the money they didn't have adequate implementation in place. Yes, and, and part of the reason why we couldn't get any further into that issue is there were lots of finger pointing when we started asking the questions, and the people that accepted the money and were running the programs when it started are no longer there. But uh, and, and so th that's where I know my time is expanded, but I just want to have you think about this: is that capacity building is our future? If we're going to get out of anything, we've got to leave the host country uh, with its capacity to to function. And it seems to me we do not review we just sort of throw money it's a war we got to you know we got to fight the war and then and we, and we waste so damn much money that we c shouldn't be wasting we ought to have be smarter about capacity building and we ought to have your inputs in how to do that Ms. Fordenberry your highest recommendations, your best recommendations for legal changes that would save money and improve outcomes? Well, I think we, we talked a little bit a few minutes ago about our recommendations in the retailers, uh, the SNAP retailer report. Other recommendations um, are to look at implementation of how programs are being run. I'm thinking in terms primarily of the uh, crop insurance program to make sure that the improper payments rates are being hit there and that the um, program is being implemented and overseen as effectively as it can be, as well as the conservation programs. There have been a number of new programs enacted that we want to take a look at. Uh, we recognize that there are a number of management challenges there that need to be addressed. I assume the, the mission of your office is twofold. One is to ensure effective implementation of the law as written by Congress, but then to turn and make suggestions about how, if the general goal is such, certain programmatic changes empowered by uh, legal considerations uh, could be implemented to make, again, the outcome more effective. The more you can specify that, the more helpful it is. Um, this conversation has been very good and productive and helpful, but again, bringing it down into very narrow specifics that we can include in must passes, must pass bills. And not a lot of things get passed on a regularized basis, uh, but when we have something that can improve outcomes and save money, um, it, 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 it's helpful, I think, to all of us, speaking on behalf of my colleagues with limited staff and limited resources to be able to pinpoint specific things in terms of an outcome here. Again, I, it, it's not meant to put you in a, in, a, in a political position, but consistent with the mission that's already laid out in law, if certain changes would be made, this mission would be met better or and or savings could be achieved. Um, in that spirit, I would draw the committee's attention to the question of overlap and duplication in programs. I think all of you know that GAO has issued a number of reports on overlap and duplication across government entities. And one of the, um, some of the issues that they identified were potential overlap in the, in the nutrition programs, as well as potential overlap in RD and business enterprise programs. And we have issued a report, I think in the last year, making some recommendations with respect to nutrition programs and how uh, the Department and Congress could think about those issues. We are in the process of doing a report on potential 
overlap and duplication in the RD business enterprise programs, which I think will be issued in the next f several months. So I would, I would draw your attention to some of those reports. I'm familiar with the GAO's last work in this regard, and I think they're in the process of updating that now. It, one of the difficulties is we always want a number. Give us the number of what we can save. And those reports, the GAO is hesitant to give a number, preferring instead to talk in terms of broad ranges of a probability of tens of millions of dollars, whereas some people interpret this as into the billions or even hundreds of billions of dollars. So that's, that's one of the difficult problems here, a again, to, to narrow it down and to try to get hard numbers so that we can prioritize what makes sense and work it through a process here, which is, again, quite difficult to get consensus with. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Pingree. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for all of your uh, comments and answers today. Um, at the risk of duplicating, I, I just want to reinforce um, Mr. Fortenberry talked about this, Mr. Bishop talked about this, and I mentioned it in the beginning. But I do think there's particular interest in some of the things that you talked about, the actively engaged rules. Um, Mr. Bishop said, you know, the idea of people who receive direct payments and other subsidies that have nothing to do with or aren't really participants in farming. Um, I know there's always a little political, there's always a lot of political interest around SNAP and SNAP recipients and retailers and all the fraud and potential fraud in that program and how much it can add up because of the big dollars in the program. But as you mentioned earlier, sometimes in the subsidy programs when you discover that there's been a lot of people involved, $33 million, $40 million, nothing gets under people's skin like this idea that there are crop subsidies going out there that don't go to farmers, that go to, you know, mainly zip codes in big East Coast cities. I mean, there's just a lot of interest in this. And I know you've done some work, but I just want to reinforce that this is an area, I think, of continuing concern. It came up a lot in the Farm Bill and with all the changes in the Farm Bill. You know, it will take you a while to sort out how this could be looked at. But um, I just think it's a really critical area to be examined. The dollars are high. Uh, you mentioned that um, there's always a lot of exotic legal arrangements, legal maneuvers. I would say the second thing that really gets under people's skin is when they realize that a lot of lawyers figure out a lot of fancy maneuvers and then somehow the money doesn't go to the right people. Mr. Farr mentioned an issue that's a big issue in my district. I don't have a lot of um, subsidized crops. I don't have corn, wheat, all the big ones, but we have a lot of vegetable growers, a lot of people who are trying to expand their very small farms, and the first thing they'll always say to me is, how come the money always goes to all those other guys and there's so little available to us? It's a huge resource issue for USDA. You know, every time we manage to enhance a little bit in some of those areas, uh, people always look at it and say, well, what about the billions? Seventy times as much money goes into the commodity crops as into specialty crops, quote unquote, which is really the vegetables and things that people want to buy locally, they want to buy direct. There's huge consumer interest in this. So I just can't say it enough. And I thought that, um, you know, one of my issues that I was so pleased that Mr. Fortenberry brought up, but I was going to say the same thing is, you know, sometimes the only way you can skirt a legal maneuver is by understanding what legal changes Congress can make that at least you know, take the lawyers three years to figure out how to change it again. So I, I think that's extremely beneficial, particularly in this area where it's not just the simple thing of, you know, like snap fraud, somebody gives their card to somebody else. And, you know, it's not that easy. It's very complicated. I understand that. But sometimes that means we need real suggestions and ideas of how to get at the root of this and how to make those changes. Because I think this is a big issue in how resources are divided around um, supporting farmers in this um, country and very lopsided. And as you said, when the, when the fraud is discovered, it's usually big, it involves a lot of people, and it's often not going to the people who literally are putting the hard work in a farm every day. So I do hope as you're looking into the next year and how your resources will be spent, um, that, that you really hear that that's bipartisan across the board, across the country, people are concerned with that issue. Uh, the only other thing that I wanted to bring up, and I, I think you've answered a lot of questions about um, are there adequate resources. It, it, it seems as though, given the number of things we want to know about and the challenges that are out there, um, there are never adequate resources, um, particularly in a cost-cutting time. But um, it would be helpful just to hear a, a little bit more about that. Um, 
Oh, and the only other specific question I was going to ask you previously, you mentioned something that you were looking into in the future about WIC food costs. I didn't know exactly what you're referring to, so to the little time I have, um, and I know you're going to say you need more resources, so maybe you should ask me to answer the food cost thing first. Yeah, the, the, on the WIC food costs, we've got a, an audit currently underway where we're looking at how states manage those costs and, and with the food packages. We've seen some states have high food costs, others have lower food costs, and see if there's any efficiencies or consistencies that can go from one state to another. Um, and that, that's something we're working on right now and expect to have out in the next several months. Great. Thanks, I'm good. Okay, Mr. Bishop. Thank you very much. Uh, the uh, YG recently released its Pickford II audit, uh, which was required by Congress as a part of agreeing to fund the settlement of the case against the Department. I was pleased to learn that, in your opinion, the final adjudication process of Pickford claims and related administrative issues uh, went relatively smooth. Uh, outside of a handful of claims, I think about 20, uh, which may not have been handled properly. Uh, in your audit report, uh, you said that in connection with our audit, nothing came to our attention to indicate that the administrative entities were not adequately implementing the claims process in accordance uh, with the settlement agreement. So it would appear that uh, USDA and Department of Justice did a pretty good job in managing and placing adequate controls on the final adjudication process. Uh, would you say that that is correct? And uh, of the 20 problems that you had, how many uh, claims were successfully paid out uh, appropriately? <coughs> Let me just offer a couple of comments on that audit. Um, as you point out, we're required by law to do a, an audit, a statistical sampling audit of finally adjudicated claims. Because this um, issue has been of great interest to an, a lot of people. We decided to do an audit prior to final payout of claims just to make sure that the process was running correctly. And so as you pointed out, um, we generally found that the process that was developed was a good process to handle the adjudication. We did find a, some problems that we pointed out to the uh, neutral and arbitrator, and they, to their credit, took action on those during our audit and um, are dealing with that, they are now in the process of getting ready to pay the claims, at which point we are now starting our statutorily required audit of the claims that have actually been paid to make sure that the money is going to the right people who are eligible. So um, I just wanted to tell you that we've, we're doing a little bit more than required by law to ensure that this whole process runs effectively. How many total claims were there? Are they are you paying out? Say in the neighborhood of forty thousand. I'd have to go back and look at the get the specific. Somewhere number. in the neighborhood of forty thousand. I think so, but I'd have to go back and and, and you that. picked up the uh, some possible problems with twenty of those. Well, we took a sample of a hundred claims to look at, and of those hundred claims, we found thirty-five of them had some questions. So that, that was a random sample. Uh, at this stage of the game, we're now involved in auditing claims that have actually been paid, and we'll see how that turns out. Okay. Um. Thank you. Um, you've gone through several staff reductions, including volunteer buyouts and early retirements. Uh, given the impact of, of sequestration and uh, the related administrative reductions uh, in the department's funding, uh, your staff has been hit pretty hard. Uh, what has been the impact on your ability uh, uh, to carry out and uh, your responsibilities uh, to identify and undertake new audits uh, and investigations with which you are tasked? And are there audits which you would like to have uh, undertaken, but you were unable to undertake as a result of uh, a lack of funding or lack of staff? Well, as you know, um, we were not exempt from any of the reductions and sequestrations. And 
as a result of that, we have taken significant uh, reductions to our resources, especially on our staff. Uh, we are at the lowest level of staffing that we've ever had. And because of that, we've had to really narrowly define our priorities and just we've, been, we've only been able to focus on the highest priority work. Uh, we are very grateful for the increase that you all are giving us in 14. Um, in 13, FY13, we had to uh, basically eliminate training. We, there was a period of time where we could not do any job-related travel on our investigation side, which, uh, as you can imagine, was very challenging because allegations of fraud come in from around the country, and if our investigators can't travel there, it's, they can't really look into that. Um, on the audit side, we lost very experienced staff, weren't able to backfill there, and so we were not able to undertake all of the audits that we would normally want to undertake. Uh, but, you know, as you know, the IG function is a level of resource function. To the extent that we have resources, we can do more work, and we can bring back um, our return on investment, which is roughly $12 for every dollar invested. Uh, so we, we believe that it, we are a good investment for the taxpayer. But you haven't been able to do all that you were obligated to do uh, with the directives that you've received from Congress and under the law uh, because of uh, limited resources. I would say on the audit side, the way we continue to prioritize our work, those mandatory things, if we have direction from Congress or like the financial statements or IT security or improper payments, those go at the top of the list. Those are the first ones that are going to be part of the plan. Then we go into what I view as our discretionary time, and that's where we really look at the risk associated with different programs at the department. Are they a new program? Have we seen pro problems before? And we just continuously have to prioritize that each year. And, you know, but as staff has gone down, then there's less that is planned. But we, you know, try to keep that on the forefront as we go. Thank you. Uh, let me follow up with uh, a little bit what Mr. Bishop was uh, talking about uh, as far as the resources. Uh, in your testimony um, uh, and the most recent semiannual report to Congress, uh, which was released last December, you write that since uh, FY12, uh, the Office of the Inspector General's appropriations have fallen to the lowest level uh, since 2008, and the staffing is at the lowest level the agency has established. Uh, of course, Congress was able to provide full funding for your office for FY14. Uh, will this allow you to address the uh, staffing needs? We are right now um, backfilling or filling critical vacancies that became vacant. And that, that's very important to us. We are also anticipating that we will be able to do some hiring of entry-level auditors and investigators, which is critical to our future success. Uh, we have not been able to hire new staff for several years because of hiring freezes and um, you know, the potential for furlough, which fortunately we didn't have to do. So we are looking this year to bring back and fill some critical vacancies we don't have a precise number yet, but we can keep your staff apprised of that. How will the full funding affect the priorities that you set for your audits and investigations for a remainder of the uh, fiscal year? I guess we're, the way I would answer that, we're, we're implementing our plan as we put it out last October. Uh, but you know, next week I meet with all of my audit directors from around the country to talk about it. Are there any mid course corrections that we need to make? Is there anything that we thought was a priority that really wasn't the priority it needed to be? Is there something that needs to take its place? And so that's something that we do at least twice a year to see if there's any specific changes. And then we make changes to the plan as different things come in and are brought to our attention, like if there's a congressional request or something from the Secretary's office. Oh, Inspector Fong, you, you um, uh, talked a little bit about uh, uh, IT um, security uh, and uh, FY10, 11, and 12, uh, USD had the worst cybersecurity score of all the large departments. Um, as you know, USDA's uh, score comes from uh, your officer's view of the office of the uh, chief information officer. Uh, the scoreboard for FY13 has not yet been released. Uh, do you see uh, improvements? 
We would characterize the department's progress on this as slow, but moving in the right direction. Um, we have, you know, as you all know, issued a number of very significant audits on various aspects of the IT security program at USDA. The bottom line here is that the CIO recognizes that this is a major weakness that needs to be addressed. And what we are recommending to the CIO is that they focus on, they, they identify and focus on a priority grouping of issues to deal with and accomplish that and then go ahead and move on with identifying a second group and a third group and a fourth group so at least they can show measurable progress. And what we have seen is that um, in the last year, the CIO has issued some significant policy directives in three areas in the department to give guidance to the agencies. Uh, th we think that's a very good first step. Um, th they need to keep continuing to take concrete steps and ensuring that the agencies then implement within their own jurisdictions. And that, that I think, is one of the big challenges for the CIO. Does Congress need to consider legislative changes to help USDA address the problem? Um, I should give some thought to that. My initial response is that there is quite a bit of guidance in law and regulation. Um, NIST puts out all kinds of directives on how these programs need to be addressed. Uh, I, I don't think there's a lack of guidance and requirements. So I'm, I'm not sure what additional legislative action would be appropriate. Perhaps continuous reporting might be uh, useful. Mr. Farr. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> You know, as we have this discussion, it, it strikes me that the IGs are um, sort of the fiscal grand jury of the federal government. Uh, you do these reviews like our civil grand juries do back in California, and, and they come up with recommendations for how local government can improve itself. Um, and I just wondered if, as chair of the council, of of Inspector Generals on Integrity and Efficiency, CG, is that what you call it, CG? Siggy. C? Right, that's it, C-I-G-I-E. How do you pronounce it? Siggy. Siggy. As chair of Siggy, um, is there a, a report that Siggy puts out on every year, sort of prioritizing what are the common needs of the across the board, all 73 agencies that have IGs? Actually, we do. We put out an annual report uh, to Congress and the President, and I'd be happy to provide your staff with a copy of that. Yeah, I think it would be very interesting. I mean, I, I, I think Mr. Uh, Thornberry and, and, and Ms. Ping Pingree and, and well, all of us on, up here have said is that we're looking for fixing things that are broken. We're, I, I, mean, I would hope that maybe even the Council could talk about it. And you do, do the reports the way you're doing, but it would be also, also very helpful to us if you get a list of, as we begin, this is the first hearing we have, so all of the Department of Agriculture is going to come in here after you. And it would really be good to set us up with, you know, things that need fixing that we could address our approach to, address our uh, questions to. So I think that the presentation of, for all IGs, is, would be improved if we could get those mm -hmm. kinds of questions that everybody here has been asking you. And I'd just take it back to the Council and, and see if that could be part of the presentations that you all make. Uh, I think it would put us and, and, and your IGs in general in a, a much better, uh, more useful, I guess, uh, more useful to us as, as lawmakers, rather than just, I mean, do, we certainly the audits are important and all of that, but the information from those audits is try to improve our, our lawmaking. That's what we do, and our spend, and our uh, allocation of uh, limited resources. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bishop? 
Okay, well, thank you for your uh, testimony here this morning, uh, and uh, we look forward to working with you as we uh, go through the uh, um, appropriations for um, FY15, and uh, again, we appreciate your uh, information. Look forward to following up on some of the things you'll be presenting to the uh, subcommittee that uh, on the follow-up questions. So with this, uh, the hearing is adjourned.